Hi, thank you again for taking the time to come here today. The first thing I would like to ask you about is your career. You've had a long list of titles that we've just named, and we were wondering, is there a favorite? A favorite for place. You? A favorite... Uh, Position uh, you've held. Oh, well, yes, uh, absolutely. The, the, there are actually two positions that I held that were my favorites. One was as a director for the Department of European Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, much more than when I became director general, because when you're a director general, you are rather far away from the people that are working for you. And as a director, you stand much more closer to the collaborators and there is a much more intense cooperation with the people around you. Um, so that was very captivating, but um, the, my, my top favorite is absolutely uh, ambassador to the European Union because, um, well, Brussels is a thrilling uh, place if you are interested in European affairs and you, um, you are busy uh, virtually every day from early in the morning to late at night with your colleagues, with the European Commission, with European parliamentarians, and um, you have a lot of freedom. And um, a lot of, of course, you work on behalf of the government and you have instructions, but at the same time, there is a lot of room for your own initiative, and um, so the, I, I enjoy that uh, very, very much. Why devote so many years of your life to representing the Netherlands at the EU? In, in Brussels, you mean? Well, why, yeah. What, yes. Was there a particular calling? Or? Well, well um, that, that, that's a good question. In uh, European diplomacy um, is a very special type of diplomacy, you need a lot of experience. And normally speaking, um, when you are an ambassador to another country, you change every four years. Uh, but you see that most of the member states in the European Union, they keep their ambassadors to the European Union for a much longer period. Because the, the, the negotiating skills uh, that you need, you develop them slowly and so it's, it's important to, uh, to keep those skills as long uh, as you can, and therefore you stay much longer than that. Um, for example, my, my predecessor stayed also, uh, like I, uh, for nine years in, in Brussels. Uh, but I had even um, colleagues from other countries, like France or Belgium, who stayed sometimes 12 years as ambassador. Okay, that sounds very interesting and a long commitment to a job. Yeah. yeah. I think um, what, what seems to us uh, is also that a lot of your career has not been spent in the public eye that much, well, maybe compared to representative politicians. Yeah. Is this something that you always intended to do? Yes. Um, in, in, um, I, I always felt that working behind the scenes was in a way more interesting because it's much more substantial. And you can actually do a lot. Um, whereas being in the public is much more the image of what you're doing and is much less uh, on the substance. What um, is this? And, and also, um, I was always interested in politics and that's why I, I started to study political science when I was a, when I was a student. Uh, but being a politician myself, um, in the beginning, did not attract me because I, I um, thought my privacy was very important. And when you're a politician, you're always, you know, in the newspapers and television, etc. And um, at that time, I didn't want to do that. Once I um, uh, left the Foreign Service, um, then I thought, okay, now I'm old enough and um, now it's time uh, to, to be more a public figure than when I was a diplomat. But you mentioned that uh, you can do a lot behind the scenes. What, kind, what is that a lot? What kind of influence can you have? Well, um, particularly if, if I concentrate on, on, on Brussels, 
um, uh, a lot of the work that you do is you negotiate with the other, with your colleagues in Brussels. Because Brussels is, uh, first of all, um, a legislative machine. Uh, there, is a, there are many proposals by the European Commission for lawmaking, and this lawmaking uh, is uh, done for a very large part uh, by the ambassadors in the European Union. So you negotiate with them. But since the, the big enlargement in 2004, um, these type of negotiations have become much more difficult because the room is now so big. We are 27 now, uh, since the UK left before we were 28. Uh, and of course, you can't negotiate with uh, 27 people around uh, the table. So what you do is that um, you form small groups, you form small alliances, um, uh, sometimes two people or three people together, and you try to influence. And, um, well, you need special skills to do that. There is not, um, I would say, a one-size-fits-all method uh, to be a, a good uh, diplomat. There are different styles. Um, but that work behind the scenes and to try to uh, fix um, uh, a target that you would like to reach and then um, uh, deploy a strategy, deploy tactics, how you arrive at that. That's a, a game that I really like. You spoke about forming blocks. Uh, coming, representing the Netherlands, were there particular countries that you found to be steady partners on particular topics or on uh, a broader set of ideas? Yeah. No, that's a very good uh, question. Um, in uh, Brussels, you do not have, let's say, permanent alliances because the alliances are always, they depend on the subject matter that is at hand. And for example, when um, the European Union negotiates trade agreements with other countries in the world, um, then uh, within the European Union, our normal partners used to be the United Kingdom. Okay, they, unfortunately, they left. But our traditional partners and alliances are Germany, the Nordic countries, most of the time the Baltic uh, countries, but much less France, or Spain or Italy, which are a little bit more protectionist. But um, on many other issues, um, it, it can be the other way around, that your main uh, ally is, is France or, um, or Italy. So it depends on the subject matter. And what is also very in interesting in, in terms of uh, negotiations in Brussels is that um, you do not necessarily um, try to form alliances. That's the normal uh, game that you try to play and try to make the alliance as big as possible to exercise influence. But sometimes it can be uh, a very interesting strategy uh, to try to work together with your biggest opponent. And um, particularly when you are at both ends of the total spectrum. And then when, for example, uh, the Netherlands, many years ago, we were at complete opposite ends on agricultural policy with France. But instead that the Netherlands was trying to forge an alliance with the like-minded countries, what we did at that time was that we um, set together with our biggest opponent. And then, when you do reach an agreement, then that auto automatically is acceptable for all the others. So it, it can be a very interesting strategy to, to look at your biggest opponent. It doesn't always work, but... Uh, so there is not... Um, always, depending on the situation, you look for the best strategy to achieve the best uh, results.
you spoke about the importance of free trade for uh, the Dutch perspective in the European Union. We see recently the European Union's response to the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act and the more protectionist measures with that. Uh, seems to be a more popular trend lately. Is this a trend that will continue for some time? Yes, I, I, I'm afraid that the, the, the time of the uh, big world uh, free trade negotiations are over. Uh, and, and you see now that increasingly there is uh, more interest for protective measures um, either for political reasons but sometimes also for reasons of protection of the environment or pro the protection of health, or the protection of uh, climate. And you see now that uh, trade, uh, which um, many years of ago was an area that was more or less standing on itself. Uh, liberalizing trade um, was good for economic growth. But now trade is always um, related to other uh, topics. And you see that uh, increasingly um, uh, trade agreements also contain um, articles that say, well, you only can import certain products if they um, reach a particular protective um, standards in the field of the environment or, or health. And that's a general trend which makes it much more difficult to achieve uh, and what does these kind, kind of, of uh, treaties. What does this mean for the Netherlands and the kind of alliances we can form? Yes, for, for the Netherlands this, this was um, a, a, a change in, in the global um, uh, discussion on trade which in the beginning was difficult to accept because the Netherlands is so dependent on, on foreign trade. Uh, but gradually uh, we started to get used to it uh, a little bit more and also because political parties in the Netherlands more and more, um, and we saw that for example in the free trade agreement that uh, the European Union concluded with Canada, uh, that um, also political parties in the Netherlands said, hey, but now we have to import all kind of agricultural products from Canada, but these products do not apply the same standards for production as we do, so that is unfair. So also in, in the, the domestic political sphere in the Netherlands, now there is less this tendency to go for free trade uh, on everything and rather other issues become more important. And um, um, an another example is that uh, the European Union can now uh, take trade measures towards countries that do not apply certain standards in the field of climate change. So trade has become, as some uh, authors claim now, trade had also has become a weapon. And do you think that this is something useful for politics? Or maybe even just for achieving climate goals? Well, um, it, if, if you apply it with a certain um, wisdom, I think it's okay. Uh, because indeed, um, nowadays, topics like climate change and protection of the environment have become uh, global issues that you have to address and it would be um, unfair if certain countries um, take measures and other countries are free riders. Um, but you have to do it always in a, measured, uh, in a measured way, which does not lead to real protectionism. Shifting a little away from the conversation about hard protectionism, more towards the idea of free trade as part of the Dutch identity, so to speak. Uh, Dutch identity in Europe seems to be a bit of a contradiction at times, sometimes quite Atlanticist and outward-looking. Outward I think you've mentioned that in the past as well. While also being a founding member of the Union, 
despite also being skeptical at times about integration and that sort of thing. Would you characterize the Netherlands as an Atlanticist state? What does that mean to you? As a? Atlanticist yeah. state, and how have the Dutch navigated these sorts of contradictions? Um, this is an interesting question. I, I think uh, the Netherlands is both um, European-oriented and Atlanticist. And um, we are an Atlanticist country when it comes to global politics, geopolitics, for our security. We rather depend uh, on the Americans than we do on, on France, for example, uh, or the United Kingdom in, in the past. But um, for uh, the internal market and for economic, um, in the economic sphere, we were very European and we were always on the, on the forefront of creating a big internal market which would be good for uh, the Dutch economy and for the harbour of Rotterdam, uh, etc., etc. So, in the economic field, very, very European, but on the political, on the strategic field, much more Atlanticist. Now, that, um, that dichotomy um, now becomes much more difficult uh, with the changing world, and we don't know what is going to happen in the United States with the elections uh, next year. Um, if Donald Trump or anything like Donald Trump would win the elections, then we are not so sure anymore that the United States itself would be interested in uh, continuing the, um, the NATO uh, alliance. Um, Donald Trump has already said now, uh, I made a mistake last time when we had all these Atlanticists in the Pentagon. This time, if I become president, I'll throw them all out. So uh, then, uh, for countries like the Netherlands, it becomes much more difficult to remain Atlanticists because we will have to look for other ways um, to protect our security. So then the Netherlands might be interested more to develop uh, an own European uh, security system. Do you think the Netherlands became less European after Brexit or more Atlanticist after Brexit? No, on the contrary. I think after Brexit we became more European. Um, and you could also see that, for example, in the public discourse by our Prime Minister, uh, Mark Rutte, before uh, the Brexit, he was also sometimes rather European Europe skepticism. And um, I remember once on television he said, when I go to Brussels, I have a pistol in my pocket, uh, which oh, is not very pro-European. <laughs> uh, but then, um, after the referendum on the Brexit in the United Kingdom in 2016, and when the result unexpectedly was, was negative, suddenly he also realized that um, it is very dangerous to always have a negative discourse on Europe because you create your own fertile ground for negativism towards, uh, towards Europe and then maybe there is a political party that would start a referendum and then um, after having sown the seeds of uh, no, you will, uh, you, will, you will harvest it. So you see that after the referendum, also the Prime Minister became much more positive about Europe. One of his per first speeches he held for the Humboldt University in Berlin at the time was very, very pro-European. And um, uh, he did that because he, of course, very well understood that the Netherlands cannot do without Europe. I mean, all our prosperity and our security part of it uh, is uh, dependent on, on Europe. So, um, very interestingly, when um, the European Union started to negotiate with the British 
how to get out of the European Union, the Netherlands was one of the toughest countries in those negotiations because they did not want a situation that um, getting out of the European Union would actually lead to some benefits for the United Kingdom, uh, having it both ways. So the Netherlands uh, really wanted to have a result that getting out of the European Union was a very bad option and would hurt uh, a country. Do you think so we really became much more European after Brexit. Do you think that was a good move by the Netherlands? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I've, I wholeheartedly supported that. And of course, in the beginning after Brexit, the, 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 um, uh, the British thought that they would be able to drive a wig between the different member states. And one of their first targets was the Netherlands because we were always, the Brits were very often our allies within the European Union. And then, well, they uh, saw this as a big surprise that suddenly the Netherlands were one of the strongest uh, in these negotiations for the exit. Yeah, now you also discussed the role of Rutte in this quite clearly, and you've been involved in Dutch foreign affairs under three different prime ministers. Yes. How much effect do you think that these political leaders have really on Dutch-European relations? Yes, uh, th this is an interesting uh, question. I, I think um, the Netherlands has been lucky that for a long, very often, we had prime ministers that, um, what we say sometimes in diplomacy, were boxing above their weight. Um, and uh, there are a couple of uh, very interesting uh, examples. For example, uh, Ruth Lubbers, who was a prime minister for a long time, nearly 13 years, for the Christian Democrats. He really uh, was someone in Europe who had a lot of influence. And um, the same goes for uh, Prime Minister Koch from the Social Democratic Party. And this was due to to, to several reasons. Um, one of the reasons, for example, was that um, he was seen as a big leader already when he was still the leader of one of the big uh, trade unions in the Netherlands, so a man with a lot of experience, but also because at the time the Netherlands was doing economically extremely well. So a lot of other countries in Europe, but even in the rest of the world, we're looking at the Dutch economic miracle. So, and that lifts up the standards of the prime minister as well, because he can say, ah, look, we are doing, ah, we are very good. So um, fortunately, we always, well, not always, but most of the time uh, we had, and certainly with Rutte too, uh, in the beginning, of course, it was, um, uh, he had to get used to Europe. But then, um, uh, with his capacity as someone who can bring people together, uh, he increasingly played a role of go-between in the European uh, summits, uh, between opposing views. Uh, so, um, he, he played a, a, a role of getting people together, and that well, this was very role... much... With, will this role change once Rutte is gone from the European scene? I, I, for the I Netherlands? think so, because the, uh, of course, much also depends on the character of the person. And for example, Prime Minister Koch was not at all someone for a go between. He was much more uh, protecting his own interests. But, but Rutte, with the type of character he has, I mean, he's friend with everybody. Uh, so he can get people together and therefore exercise influence. So it very much depends on who you are, what type of person you are. Is it good that we have such a reliance on personality when it comes to... I, I think so, yes, because you should not underestimate in Europe that, of course, um, uh, big countries have more influence than small countries. That, that goes without saying. But at the same time, personalities do play a very important role, even at the level of ambassadors. Um, and uh, so, uh, if you're, as it were, good at the game, 
then you can really make a difference. And, and certainly Prime Minister Rutte has done that. So for uh, a new Prime Minister in the Netherlands, these will be big shoes to fill. Have you um, seen the impact of personality at a more personal level in your work? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. And, um, Is there a particular see, time that you remember that you think, wow, this really stands out as, as a working of, of, of character, of personality of, of one of your colleagues or somebody you're sitting across at the table from? Yeah, sure. Um, um, uh, there are always people that, you know, have a certain charisma, that have big skills in, in convincing other people. And that really makes a difference. And, um, um, yeah. Wouldn't you say that it's maybe slightly not what we want in politics, for content to be overlooked because of charisma? Sorry, the, that the if content the, is overlooked? Yes. No, of course, in the end, um, uh, the substance in the content is important, and, and what you stand for and what you want to achieve. But um, one should not... Um, underestimate the importance of, of personalities um, I'll, I'll, or, or even of personal relationships uh, between people. I'll, I'll give you um, one example. Um, many years ago, that was at the time that Mr. Balkenende was uh, Prime Minister of the Netherlands, and he got along very well with um, the then Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Tony Blair. And we were negotiating uh, the finances of the European Union. And at the time, the Netherlands uh, wanted to have a rebate on the Dutch contribution to the European budget. And many countries didn't want to give that to the Netherlands because they said, you're a... Uh, a prosperous country, you can pay it. Um, and um, then um, these negotiations were held during the Luxembourg presidency and they failed. And then after Luxembourg came the United Kingdom. And Prime Minister Tony Blair was leading the negotiations and because he had such a good relationship with um, uh, Prime Minister Balkenende, um, we achieved a lot in those negotiations because simply of that fact, not because of substance. So it can make an important uh, difference. Of course, you've worked under a number of different Prime Ministers with slightly different goals at times. Mm -hmm. How much do your personal views about working in Europe Im impact what, what you do on a daily basis? In, in what you, you mean on, on my, my... On your pers personal level, what you think about Europe, about the place of the Netherlands in Europe, how does yeah. that factor into your work? Yeah, but to a certain extent, very much. I'm, I'm a convinced uh, European, but at the same time, when you're a diplomat, you, you do what the politicians ask from you. And um, there have been times that the Dutch were following uh, policies that I did not agree with. And then you try to advise your prime minister or the minister of foreign affairs of the wisdom of your own view. But in the end, uh, they decide. And um, um, most of the time you say, OK, if you want to do it that way, then we'll do it this way. I'm a professional diplomat. Um, it becomes a problem when these involve moral issues. Uh, and um, fortunately, I, um, sometimes I came close, but uh, I was never confronted with a situation that I thought that I could not um, morally um, support um, the position of, of the Netherlands. Could when that speak? arrives, then I think you have to think for yourself and then you have to quit. Could you speak to us about a moment when you came close to that? Well, there, 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 there were times, uh, particularly um, in the first uh, Rutte government, which was supported by, um, by, by Mr. Wilder's uh, party, then sometimes there were positions that I thought were uh, on, 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 on the verge of being 
well, so at least were beyond the limits that I uh, was able to accept. And, uh, but fortunately, um, he was kept uh, in balance by the government itself. So, um, but it, that can, it can be, you can come into a situation that you, ha that you have to ask yourself, um, can I do this, can I look myself in the, in the mirror, uh, yes or no? I think that the, the role of diplomats and the European Democratic Project on a whole, I think a lot of people have this understanding that it is something that the elite diplomats engage in, but doesn't really represent the people. Do you think that this view of European project as unrepresentative is true? No, I, well, the, the, this is a very, very difficult question um, because in, in, um, I do not believe it is true in the formal sense because everything that we do in Europe as Netherlands or any other member state is uh, very, very much democratically um, uh, founded. Uh, when um, a Dutch minister goes to Brussels, he has to come in our parliament beforehand, and parliament will uh, give the minister instructions or not. Um, when we come home, uh, much of what we did uh, has to be agreed, and so there is always a, a formally uh, a democratic legitimacy. Um, the problem, however, is that um, this is not seen by, uh, by uh, many people. And the thing that does not help is when Dutch politicians or Dutch ministers say, we have to do this from Brussels. Brussels is telling us to do this. Uh, Brussels, that's, we are Brussels. We are sitting around the table. But when you create an image that it is something that you cannot control, and that, that um, comes from, from the outside, um, then suddenly Brussels is very far away, and, and then even though formally there is democratic legitimacy, it might not be felt that way by, um, uh, by the public. And um, uh, this is the more so since... Um, in, in uh, newspapers, television, uh, people do not really see what is happening in Brussels. Eh? It's a little bit far away. Um, on Dutch television, every evening, those who are interested, you watch Newsuur or whatever program, and you see what's happening in The Hague in politics. But you don't see what is happening in Brussels. So therefore, it's, it's very far away, and that indeed creates a feeling that this is something that is not part of us. Um, so creates, uh, indeed in that sense, uh, a problem of legitimacy. This problem of democratic legitimacy is quite real, I think. We were involved with the drafting of the Treaty of Lisbon, which forms the constitutional basis for the European Union, of course, and some of the austerity measures of, with Greece. These were implemented after voters rejected earlier versions of these sorts of things. Is there a particular view among decision makers in rooms about this? Is there enough being done to reflect the, the democratic uh, will? No, I, 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 I don't think um, there, there is a, a sort of... Um, um, feeling among politicians that we want to neglect the, the, the will of, of, of public opinion. Not, not at all, but, but um, take the example when the Netherlands uh, rejected in, in the, the referendum the, the European Constitution. Um, okay, it was rejected, but as you said, later on, most of the articles of the, of the Constitution found their way in the Treaty of Lisbon. And then you can say, well, okay, that is not very democratic. But on the other hand, you politicians also have a responsibility to, to look what is generally uh, good for, for the country. And the Netherlands and France were only two countries of the 28 
uh, that said no, and all the others wanted to go ahead. Well, then you can say, okay, bye-bye, then we, um, um, we jump out of the European Union, but that's not in the interest of the country. So then there is a tension between the interest that this treaty goes ahead and the fact that the former treaty was rejected by, by a popular vote. So there is a tension, and you politicians have to deal with that. Speaking of agreements being rejected by the Dutch public, you were also involved with the drafting of the 2014 European Union-Ukraine Association Agreement, mm -hmm. which aimed at a closer tie between Ukraine and the European Union, both economically and politically, and of course, much has changed in this relationship in the, la in the past decade, yeah. suffice to say. Uh, how do you see this dynamic now and the potential for Ukraine's accession to the Union? You, you, you mean what I, <clears throat> what I feel about what's happening now? And how that's changed in the past 10 years? Yes, it has changed enormously, I, I would say. The interesting thing is that um, after the, the association agreement with uh, Ukraine, um, I mean, Ukraine was still a country that was rather far away from us. And in spite of what happened during the Orange Revolution, in spite of what happened with um, the war in, in eastern Ukraine with the little green man from, from, uh, from Russia, and despite the annexation of Crimea by, by Russia, in fact, in spite of all that, the relationship with Ukraine did not change really very, very, very much. Uh, and I would even say relationship with Russia did not change very much. We continued to trade with them, we continued to be dependent on them for our fossil fuels, and by the way, not only the Netherlands, but also other countries in the European Union. So in spite of these very negative developments, nothing basically uh, basically changed. But after the invasion in February uh, 2002, it was a complete uh, overhaul. And you suddenly saw that, that um, the whole picture uh, changed uh, completely. And rather soon uh, during, the, um, uh, during the war, um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, uh, already promised that Ukraine should become uh, a member of the, uh, of the European Union. Do you think now, whether that, that was very wise, um, I doubt it. Uh, I mean, it is understandable from an emotional point of view, and you want to give uh, as much um, support to Ukraine uh, as possible, not only in terms of money and weapons, but also in terms of moral support. But do, you, whether, do you think that the view of the Dutch public has changed on this issue? Yes, uh, absolutely. I think due to the war, uh, that view by the Dutch public has changed. Maybe not as much as some people think, but it certainly has changed. The big question is, will this remain so? And there I, I, I am rather worried uh, that you already see now that the support for Ukraine is, is gradually um, becoming less strong than it used to be over the past couple of months. And you see now a, um, a couple of, um, for Ukraine, rather negative developments. The, in the United States, uh, the financial package that had to be approved by the Senate was rejected uh, yesterday. And also at the European level, uh, negotiations are now going on to top up uh, the European budget with several billions of euros for Ukraine. And there is no agreement on that between the member states. Even a country like Germany, uh, now this has also to do with the court case in Germany on the German budget. Um, so you see that, that this um, uh, rather closed um, uh, and very strong support of Ukraine now 
tends to erode uh, a little bit. And my fear is that over the longer period, the same might happen in, in public opinion and that people will start to ask, well, Ukraine, should they become really part uh, of the European Union? And particularly if people start to understand what this really means in practice. In uh, 2014, the referendum was held because there was a sense that the people should kind of speak along to the future of Europe. Do you think that it was a right decision or should they, I know you don't agree with how Ursula von der Leyen did it now, but do you think that there is some merit to not having a referendum on an issue like this? You, you mean on the, on, on the, um, the exercise? Yeah, in the 2014 referendum. Should, oh. there, should there have been a referendum, or should they just have made a promise? Well, I, I personally, I think um, it is not for the president of the European Commission to make such, such a promise. Um, because, after all, um, this is something which uh, is very much for, for the member states. This has a lot of impact. I mean... Um, Accession of Ukraine, you cannot see that without accession of Moldova, many other countries. This has a huge impact uh, on, on the European Union. It's not like if Malta is becoming a member of the European Union. And um, according to the treaties, the European Commission should play the role of an independent objective arbiter on whether a country is ready or not to join the European Union. And she, um, uh, as it were, neglected that role and said they should become a member of the European Union. And that is, in my view, again, emotionally completely understandable, but whether it is political wisdom, I have my doubt. All right. Um, <laughs> as an Estonian, I also have my doubts. But anyways, uh, we have time for one or two audience questions. Yes, we already have one. Uh, there's going to be someone with a microphone coming up to you. I didn't study your uh, political affiliation, and I may have misunderstood what you said about Wilders, but I really am curious, uh, as the, the, this hall was yesterday filled with people who are interested in what's going to happen uh, in, the, in the present uh, Dutch uh, government forming, um, how would you navigate the situation? How would I navigate? Yeah. Well, I'm, 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 I'm not at the steering wheel anymore. <laughs> But, uh, and, and uh, as far as my political affiliation is concerned, I don't hide it. I'm a member of D66. Um, um, and um, how would I navigate? This is very difficult. Uh, the only thing is that, um, as a um, convinced European, I'm rather worried about the result of the, of the elections because... Um, not only uh, Wilders has a very negative program with regard to the European Union, he's even speaking about an exit. Now, I don't think that that's going to happen. I saw a Eurobarometer um, this morning, which was made by the European Commission, and actually the support for the European Union in the Netherlands is huge. It even over the last couple of weeks increased. Um, so this is not going to happen. Uh, but um, if a government of um, the parties that are now trying to form a government comes about, um, then it could lead to a much more negative attitude of the government towards everything that is coming from, from Brussels. Uh, and not only because of Wilders, because also a political party like the new one, New, new Social Contract, by, by Mr. Uh, Peter Omtzigt, uh, is extremely critical uh, on Europe. And um, even once, um, if the Netherlands does not get its way, uh, wants to um, uh, get opt-outs of the European cooperation. Um, so um, it's not just Wilders, it's, it's, it's much more broader, and that also goes for the political party of, of uh, Madame Caroline von der Plas. So that could lead to a big change um, in the Dutch 
attitude the Dutch, I mean, from the government towards towards Europe, and that's um, that's a, that's a worry. <clears throat> Is there another question from the audience? Yes. But how to navigate was yeah. the question. You're not yet there. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I think um, particularly um, in this case for a party like the VVD, if they participate in one way or another, for them there's a big role to control this uh, and that it does not get out of hand within the government. But for other political parties, they should do that from, um, from the opposition. And... Um, so that will mean that at least my political party and probably the Social Democrats and the Greens with Mr. Timmermans will have to be uh, very, very strong in, uh, in opposition. Okay, I'm briefly the second question, if we can get the microphone. Yeah. Um, yes, um, I would like to connect basically the point that you were just saying that we kind of see a shift in the balance in terms of political choices that we're, we're about to make or may see soon and something you said about maybe as a person individually no longer supporting what the Netherlands is doing and would you be worried that in the upcoming years we see talented people leave government functions because they no longer support what the government is doing? Well that's a, that, that's a very interesting uh, question. I, I, I spoke a lot with civil servants these days and what I see is that um, and now I, I seem a little bit an old, old grumpy man. Um, I, I see that the, there is a difference in, in, in generation. Uh, when I became a diplomat, um, we, were still, we were much more brought up with um, the Weberian, if that sounds, um, if that rings a bell, uh, Weber was the, the, the German sociologist and philosopher who had a certain vision of uh, what the role of bureaucrats and diplomats are. And th this is a very strict uh, role. But now, and I was brought up with such uh, a vision of what uh, a diplomat or a bureaucrat should be. But now there is a generation uh, and I don't criticize this at all, uh, is that um, many young civil servants uh, are much more ideological. Uh, they, they became diplomat, they became a civil servant in because they had some ideals, either in the field of climate change or world peace or, or whatever, it doesn't matter. And therefore, I see now that there is much that they view the result of these elections in, in a much more uh, critical way than, let's say, the generation uh, above. And therefore, I do not ex at all exclude, uh, to answer your question, that if, uh, but this is still an if, um, if there would be a government that would, um, well, divert from the traditional politics, that then there will be uh, a lot of people that will, as uh, civil servants, that will leave uh, the ministries. Thank you, Dio. But, but it's on the if. Huh? Thank you for the questions. Uh, we also, of course, would like to discuss the re recent developments in the Netherlands with our final questions. Um, first question we have is that, yeah, of course, Wilders won the elections. Of course, Wilders tends to be Eurosceptic. But do you think that this really reflects the um, Euroscepticism growing also within the Dutch population? No, as I said, <clears throat> I think the, um, the election of Mr. Wilders had nothing really to do with European policy. The, these had all kinds of other reasons. Uh, and, and I repeat myself, the, the Eurobarometer that yeah. came out uh, today, you see that the support for, for European Union is huge among, among the Dutch uh, public. So there, I, I don't think it has anything to do with it. But um, uh, it is true that um, at the same time that um, Wilders is not um, what happened in the Netherlands. We are not an island. Eh? You see this happening all over Europe right now. <clears throat> and this is extremely relevant for the next elections that we will have in June 
2024 uh, for the European Parliament. And you see now that uh, there will be a tendency in many European countries that there is a shift uh, towards more Eurosceptic parties, and this could lead to a situation that the composition of the European Parliament will fundamentally change. I have now in the European Parliament, you have uh, the biggest group are the, the Christian Democrats, uh, the second biggest group which comes close are the Social Democrats, and the third biggest groups are, are the Liberals. Uh, VVD and D66 are part of it. And you see now in the opinion polls that um, not only due to what happened in the Netherlands, but also what happens in, in Italy with Fratelli d'Italia, what happens in Germany with Alternative für Deutschland, and Frau Wagenknecht, and we can go on, uh, that there could be a situation that the third biggest group in the European Parliament will be the Eurosceptic uh, parties. And, and that will have a lot of influence on what, what is happening in the European Parliament. Gus Müller was on our stage yesterday, and he mentioned that uh, far-right leaders like Wilders, and uh, who have a similar worldview as him, their parties on the European level are rather fragmented, make up, sure, maybe a third of the, of the seats, but are splintered among different groupings. He claimed that they would have a limited influence on the course of, of European decision-making even after the next elections. Do you agree with this? Or? No, no. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's true that now they, uh, they do not form one single uh, group, and some some parties even uh, are not part of what we call in the Brussels, um, in the European Parliament, not part of a, of a family. Um, uh, now there are two um, right-wing groups in, in the European Parliament. But um, look, for example, at um, a party like Fratelli d'Italia, now they have only five seats in the European Parliament. Uh, but um, as things stand now in Italy, um, this could change radically because um, uh, Giorgia Meloni uh, has been uh, in government now exactly a year. She has eaten up uh, virtually the whole party of Berlusconi, Forza Italia, uh, and probably also part of Salvini's uh, party, uh, the Lega Nord. Uh, so um, Fratelli d'Italia could, if this continues, uh, deliver a huge chunk um, in the far right in the European Parliament. And if they can attract other far right parties within their grouping, then this might uh, really change and they could could be able to form a very, very powerful block in, in the European Parliament. So I agree with him for the situation as it is now, but for uh, the situation next year after the election, this could really radically change. And if you're looking at the potential of Wilders becoming the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, do you think that he would be a Prime Minister more like Meloni that would likely cooperate more with the European Union um, or more antagonistic like Orban? Well, first thing is, do I believe that Mr. Wilders will become a Prime Minister? It, hopefully I this doubt is a it. I doubt it, but, but, but I mean, it, it, it is a possibility. Um, no, I, I think... Um, his inclination will not be uh, like Meloni. Be and, and why? Um, uh, because uh, Fratelli d'Italia was not um, so much um, an, an anti-European uh, party. And they, very quickly, when she uh, came into power, understood that Italy was completely dependent on, on the European Union. And um, uh, once she uh, was aware that the um, Italian economy would collapse 
uh, if they would be antagonistic to the European Union, because Italy depends for many, many funds on, on the EU, um, and that uh, possibly this could lead to a difference in the spread of the, um, uh, at the financial markets, and that the uh, Italian banks would collapse. So she very well understood uh, that she had in Italy's interest to follow a pro-European uh, policy. Now, with Wilders, I'm not so sure. Are you concerned about it? Should we be concerned about it? Well, it all depends where you are, but I, but I would be concerned about it, yes. Okay. Yes. As a, as a way to conclude a little bit, we don't discuss the Dutch identity in the European context very often, but this discussion has been rather insightful, I think. And should this be a broader part of public discourse? Absolutely, yes. I, I, I think um, one, and I mean, there have been one or two articles in, in some newspapers uh, during the election campaign that were saying, hey, listen, why is nobody speaking about Europe? Uh, it was completely absent from, from, from the debate. Uh, even my friend Franz Timmermans never mentioned it. And this is really incredible because if you like it or not, we are part of Europe, um, we depend on it for our prosperity. Uh, and um, so it, for me, it, it, it was unbelievable that, that not a single uh, debate uh, in television or wherever um, not one single time this was an issue uh, that, was, uh, that was debated. I think I very much agree. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you for taking the time. Applause Thank for, Tom, for the, Tom De Brown, please. Thank you for asking me. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much.